It's so unique meeting people who've just taken a completely alternate path. You've been going for a little over a year. 27,000 orders in the last quarter for a total of 3.12 million US dollars in sales. That is an absolutely mind-blowing story. Living in this world never really made sense. So for me, there was always a question that was lingering off to the shoulder. I wasn't actually looking for a product. It was really a spiritual quest. <laughs> Fractured my C6, C7 in my neck. It was just like this visceral feeling of something leaving my body. It was like the ego had died. And this is where all of the products started unfolding. Known as black gold by the indigenous through the Himalaya mountains. It's called And really, I see it as a product whose time has come. Just for perspective, how much had you put into the business at this point? We had no money left. How the hell are we going to actually get this product sold? So what I did was... What's up, guys? You are in for a genuinely very, very special podcast today. We have two incredible local entrepreneurs from Brisbane and the Sunshine Coast in the studio that tell the incredible story of Mana Vitality or manavitality.com. These guys spent several years in product development and have launched the product in the United States doing over a million dollars US per month from a single product in under a year. But what is so special about this podcast, guys, is yes, we get into all the business metric stuff that we always get into and dig into, and there's some absolute gold here around how to grow a brand authentically using influencers at scale in the United States. Well, not even at scale, but just effectively in the United States, but also how to do it without selling your soul and actually doing it with a product that is just so compelling and fills your heart and soul to talk about. These are two extraordinary entrepreneurs that are a shining light of hope for people who want to build an authentic and profitable business all in one. Stick around right till the end because this one goes in all sorts of directions, deep into the spiritual side of life and then deep into the metrics of building a high growth company in a modern world. Enjoy. Hey there, here's a fun but sad fact for us. Most people who love our content are still not subscribed to the channel. Now, here's the deal that I will make with you. If you can find it in your heart to click on the little subscribe button below, I promise you that we will get better and better guests on this show so that we can interview them for you to give you better and deeper insights from people that have really done some crazy good stuff. And I promise you that we'll be working harder than ever to make this show even better for you. So that's the deal. If you click on that little subscribe button, hit the notifications bell as well, we would be deeply grateful and we'll make a better show for you going forward. I hope you enjoy the rest of the episode. What is up everybody? Welcome back to Unemployable. It is fabulous to have you here. We have an incredible episode for you here today. We've got two Australian entrepreneurs from Byron Bay, right? You guys are from Byron? Basically, yes. Basically, Byron. This is going to be fun. So this is going to meander off into business and spirituality and all kinds of really cool stuff. Um, I actually watched a pod with you uh, the other night and it's fascinating. I can't wait to dive in. Um, and uh, how are you, Eric? You good? I'm good. I'm excited, actually. Yeah. Yeah, because this is something I, the spirituality piece is something my missus is always telling me I need to work on because I'm always on. And yeah, mixed with the business is pretty cool. Yeah, I found that really fascinating because a lot of people sort of think that, you know, having a heart and being, um, you know, connected spiritually, emotionally to your brand and to your product, they're kind of like mutually exclusive. It's like the people who do that usually are like hippies that are not that successful in business. And then there's guys that are like the hardcore business guys that are just all about the money. But you guys have kind of blended this really, really well and have done incredibly well with your product and you've retained your integrity and your heart and your soul and it's really built around your journeys as people which i think this is going to be just so much fun to dive into so thank you both for being here yeah thanks for having us thanks thank for having you. us so just to set this up guys uh why don't you just give us the headline on the business just give us an overview of just 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 a quick headline of the metrics around the business and financial metrics and then what we're going to do is jump online have a look at the website get the audience familiar with the product and then we're going to just dive in and just learn all about mana vitality. So what's the what's the headline numbers on it? Um, that'd be great. 
Yeah, so we kicked off March last year. Uh, we sold 110,000 in our first month. This is uh, US dollars. And then we've been growing between 20 and 30% month on month. We've had a couple of months where we grew just over 30, like 33, 34%. Uh, that translates into uh, last month we did 9,000 sales, average sale value of $111. So it was 1, 000, uh, sorry, $1 million and $40 for the month. Uh, we had uh, 47,000 visits to the website um, and that's all just from one product. So we've just launched a second product. We're launching another product next month and then we've got our, uh, a big product coming out in June 21st. So we'll expect to double that uh, revenue this month, um, or sorry, this year by December. So uh, as I said, we, we did a million the last two months because um, we had flat growth in March, but now with the new product lines, um, we're just going to basically run the same algorithm that we ran for one product for the additional two products. Um, so we'll get that to uh, two million a month by December. So let me just get this right. So a million dollars US last month? Correct. And you've been going for a little, 12, 13 months, a little over a year. Yeah, so that's about months. one point five million dollars Aussie per month. Wow. Correct. Yep. That's absolutely insane. You're sharing to me before we rolled tape, twenty seven thousand orders in the last quarter for a total of three point one two million US dollars in sales, and you're based in Byron Bay, basically. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> that is an absolutely mind blowing story, and congratulations. It's great to hear. I heard on another pod that you're the fastest growing supplement, Australian supplement in the US right now. Is that true? Correct. That's yeah, amazing. fastest growing Australian-based supplement business in the US. That's incredible. That yeah. is absolutely incredible. So let's start at the beginning. Um, let's orient the audience to start with because the first question people are going to have is what the hell are these guys selling, right? It's, uh, you know, does it come over the Mexican border, if you know what I mean? <laughs> um, <laughs> so let's draw up the website. The website, guys, to go check this out is manavitality.com. Uh, Greg, we might just throw this on the screen here. The first thing I notice about this website is just how absolutely beautiful it is. I mean, look at this. Um, it's not only stunning, but it actually piques my curiosity as to what is that big black lump of stuff <laughs> that you're putting into the water. Um, in a nutshell, maybe just scroll down a little bit, Greg, so we can just uh, see that a little bit. Okay, the packaging's gorgeous. Um, a little bit further down. And these aerials are amazing. All right, let's pause there. We've got energy and longevity, brain, sex drive, immunity, beauty, and glow, which is wonderful with a beautiful graphic. And you've got two sort of core products. Is that is that basically right? The two that are on the desk here? Correct. Okay, that's awesome. Awesome. All right, so in a nutshell, just tell us a little bit about these products. What are the products and how did you guys come to be selling them? Yeah, I mean the black the the clump of black stuff is is known as black gold by the indigenous through the Himalayan mountains. Yeah. Uh, it's called shilajit, and really I see it as a product whose time has come. Right. We realised that a decade ago. We've been on a journey to find the absolute best versions of shilajit on the planet, and then we've been on a journey to find the best way to package those and the best ways to make it taste palatable, right. which we've been in R&D for about five years. So we know how powerful the ingredient is, and then we mix that with uh, ocean plasma that we get from the Dead Sea, and we know how powerful that is. So because we have these two incredible raw materials who, as I said, we believe their time has come, for us it's just a matter of making those available as stewards of those, marketing it correctly, bringing the right affiliates on board, and then the rest's been pretty easy. Yeah, right, amazing. So what are the benefits of Shilajit in a nutshell? Yeah, like it says on the website, uh, the main three there is energy, brain performance, so it's an incredible nootropic, uh, and everyone can do with energy and uh, some extra focus, right? Especially yep. in our modern world. And then the sex drive component's really about libido, fertility. Uh, there's a lot of clinical studies on testosterone, sperm count. Um, we've, it's amazing how many people have come back to us that have fallen pregnant, that have been trying to get pregnant, 
So basically what it's doing is it's getting our blood and all the fluids in the body functioning correctly. It's giving them back all of those micronutrients and all of that electromagnetic potential that we're now lacking because that's not in our food because it's not in our soil. So there's a big problem solution there that we're solving. Yep. Uh, but yeah, really just um, like filling the blood and the fluids of the body with those nutrients, both physically and energetically, is why people are having such incredible results. Okay, so you've got these these incredible benefits. And when we open this here, it's, it's, it's kind of unique the way you've packaged it. So you basically are tearing it open or folding it in half and it goes into the water and you drink it. Is that basically it? And in the box is a 30-day supply. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so the way that the sachets work, because the biggest problem with Shilogy over the years, so the market in the US is quite educated um, for the last 15 years on Shilajit. And it was always a bit of a pain because you'd have to get it out of like a, a glass jar. And when it was like getting cold or hot, the actual Shilajit would stick around the thread of the jar. So you'd use half of it and it would just lock tight. So you couldn't get it off. So the delivery mechanism is something that we've spent a long time with in R&D to get things. We've actually went through the US with industrial designers coming up with a solution for a massive problem. It was a big pain point. Um, and we've come up with that technology that basically you snap it with one hand that anyone can use from like a, a young person to an old person to snap it in a sachet and you're one and done for the day. It's, yeah, it's perfect. Brad and I drove around in a, in a <laughs> van in 2018 through LA visiting industrial designers uh, sleeping in the car, yeah. trying to find a way to administer it um, in a way that was just going to be simple and easy and save people time. Yeah, so. and I think you, you were saying off camera that a lot of your business now is subscription. And I mm -hmm. think when you buy a product like this and it comes in 30 exact single-use type set up like that, it really does lend itself much more to a subscription model. Would you say that's true and, and can you share the data on like how much of your business is subscription and how much is not? Yeah, so I mean, it's a product that you can take every day and the longer that you take it, it's gonna have more benefits for you, mm. which is perfect for a subscription model. So yeah. I would certainly advise that in a consumable business is having like a daily dose that works, selling 30 daily doses in a packet and we get about 30% subscriptions from wow. new orders, which is really high. Yep. Uh, so yeah, we've kind of, I feel like through the last 12 months, we've figured out a formula that works as well. Obviously you need an incredible product, incredible quality to back that up. But as far as an operational formula, uh, we feel like we've, we've found out some pretty um, like amazing ways to create a business and grow it really fast yeah and have it sustainable and a lot of that sustainability is through those that subscription model yeah yeah so we'll dive in and break that down more but i'm really interested in the backstory on the product and you guys first because um i, I think a lot of times people hear all the metrics and the business you know strategies which we will definitely get into because i'm so curious about how you scaled so quickly but what you said there is dead right. You actually have to have a great product and it took you years of R&D. Like you started marketing 12 months ago, but maybe you could take us back to all the story that led to finding this product because you can't build an empire on a, on a poor product. And obviously you've got a great product, especially because people could just buy this and not buy it again. That's not happening, especially when they're going on subscription. So how did you guys come across this black gold Shilajit product. What's the backstory there? Yeah, it was. It wasn't actually looking for a product or even raw materials. Um, it was really a a spiritual quest. Yeah, <laughs> to be honest, and uh, that was a journey of answering some big personal questions like, "Who are we? What are we doing here?" And that led us on a path of visiting a lot of these places that we now know as like sacred spaces and as we were visiting those areas there was specific raw materials or specific products that people were introducing us to that were calling like the fountain of youth or um you know elixir of life 
and they had a lot of these qualities of like longevity or healing people of all kinds of ailments. Uh, and then there was the other substance, which is Ormus, uh, and that was talked about by the Egyptians of like, you know, having superpowers um, where you could commune with the gods or, you know, one with the gods. Uh, so that was kind of an Egyptian slash a scene thing, which is all through the Middle East and Africa. Right. Uh, so that's the two main active ingredients. There's the Ormus, which is kind of like that uh, superconductor, as well as all of the electrolytes in a very, very concentrated form. And then there's the Shilajit, which is the black resin from the high Himalayan mountains, which had kind of that longevity um, and um, kind of, you know, it, it's used as a medicine over there for thousands of years and is, is written about in some very uh, high level uh, books and texts like the Canon of Medicine uh, and Mineralogy, which is, um, um, you know, texts that a lot of doctors have used to heal people of all kinds of things, like I said. So um, once we started diving in, like once we knew what we had, as two incredible raw materials. Then I guess we went down that path as well of testing them mm. and saying, you know, what's in these things? Yeah. And um, that's been an incredible journey for us as well because we now understand the micronutrients to be in them as really the building blocks for life and the entire material world. So without those building blocks, without the full spectrum of them, that expression of materialism has to be compromised in some way. And that's when we find like disease or disharmony showing up in the biological system. Okay, so <laughs> no, that's awesome. And I wanna dig into that. So you guys, how long have you been mates? 30 years. 30 years you've been mates. Yeah. Okay, so you've been mates for 30 years. And when did this, you said it started with like a spiritual sort of, um, you know, moment of introspection where you got to a place in your life where you're like, what are we here for? What's this all about? Can you take us to that moment? Like where were you in your life when you just sort of got to that point of like, were you both corporate guys or were you both, I think you were a sports, a sports guy, professional sports guy. Yeah. Can you take us to where you were in your life and when, how you came to this, it's kind of like the hero's journey, right? Like when you got the challenge, you got the call and then you, you went and took the call. Can you take us to that moment and what you actually did? Because I think a lot of people listening get to a point in their life where they're like, there's got to be more. I feel like there's something inside. And then you followed that calling. So can you just take us back to that time and then what you actually did at that time to begin that? I know a little bit of it because I've heard it before and it's an epic tale and I'd love to hear more about that. And, and was it at the same time? Like did you guys both enter this kind of spiritual realm together or did one drag the other one in and go, come on this journey with me? Yeah, it's, um, it was like what we're talking about off camera with the zeitgeist and a lot of those films. Nothing really made sense. Like the living in, a, living in this world never really made sense the way it was portrayed. So for me, it was always, there was always a question that was lingering off to, off to the shoulder. So it was almost that for me is looking for that like deeper knowing within myself. Um, and I come from a sporting background um, played a lot of rugby, um, got injured, um, and then just went on a different segue in my life where I um, fractured my C6, C7 in my neck and pulsated the disc between the 6 and 7 and fractured my C7. And I remember lying on the, on the, uh, on the bed and it was just like this visceral feeling of something leaving my body. It was like the ego or, or that part of my life had died. And for about four or five years after that, I went into corporate, into sales jobs. And we always talk about it, like those sales jobs and marketing jobs in the construction industry and stuff that I had, they were incredible bed of knowledge that I learned to those next steps as well. So it wasn't until, you know, I got to the end and was successful in, in those sort of pursuits, I went, there's still something missing for me here. Um, and it was around the same time Dave was off um, doing his sort of spiritual pursuits and through osmosis, I was going, oh yeah, that feels right for me as well. So it was a, a deeper lingering story to go on that journey for myself. And I just had the opportunity and I just basically renounced everything and, and basically sold all my Hugo Boss's suits, chucked them all in the Vinnie's bin and just went into the middle of the country 
into the middle of um, the outback with um, Dave, another dear friend of ours, Marty, and it just snowballed from there. And it was, it was the first time in my life I actually went in the flow of things instead of like logically going through certain steps and plans and here's my five-year goal, here's my 10-year goal. It was almost for the first time I was in sync with the flow of nature and then understanding the na natural world was putting my attention because our greatest currency is attention and intention. So I just focused on those two things and I went so deep down the rabbit hole of, you know, esoteric knowledge, um, and this is where all of the products started unfolding, you know, with a lot of the secrets of all ages. And then they were talking about this philosopher's stone and all these substances that you could actually like create yourself, but actually we're finding sort of little breadcrumbs along the way that were pointing to all of this. So almost doors were opening on that journey. And it was, it was so inspiring from a point of view that like there was so much depth to it that was just inconceivable from the mind so where were you living at this point before that just to when you threw your hugo boss suits and all that away yeah i was in brisbane so you're in brisbane yeah you burned your suits yeah you jumped on a quest with dave and marty yeah and where, where like is this where you went to uluru is this a different time yeah this is uluru yeah yeah so we spent some time out there um yeah, we, we spent about a month out there. So you just... <laughs> this, I, I, know, I know, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so you know how many people like dream of doing that? I think there's a part of so many people listening to this that want to hit the fuck it switch in their life and just go, you know what, fuck all of this. I'm mm. fucking done. I just want, it just doesn't feel right. It's like the matrix. There's a splinter in their mind. There's something wrong. You don't know how to describe it. That's pretty much what you're describing. Follow the white rabbit, right? Yeah, totally. But you actually did it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Follow the white rabbit. Look, turns out yeah. to be um, Dave. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it's it's one of those things individual for everyone because at that time I didn't have kids, still don't have kids. So the responsibilities weren't there as like as a householder. Mm. And I feel like that's what we're designed for as well. At a certain part of our life, there's a deeper question that we've got to answer and the only way that we can answer it is if we go within. And and we're lucky or blessed or grateful, whatever you want to say, is that the, we're stewards for these products and we've got such a reverence to these products. For us, it's one of those things where we're super guided with what sort of presents with us as well. If if the timing's right, there was one, there's one occasion when we're in the deep south of Tasmania and I think I had a surfing accident. So the body is always sh showing me through pain what we should be doing or shouldn't be doing. So I had a surfing accident down here on the Gold Coast at Kurumba and got jammed underneath the rocks at um, the alley and then jumped on a plane like a week later, nearly died, jumped on a plane a week later, it was in Tassie. And it was a stage of the project where we had those products, Shilajit Normous as two individual products. And we decided I had a, a massive gash out of my foot and we went for a walk in the deep southwest it was about 15 k's and it was halfway through the walk and i said oh because we were about to give it all up there's a one of those segues where we we're going to give the whole thing up we said no i've got this massive rush and i said we've got to keep going like because it's always that there's always a level where you just got to go beyond that level and beyond that level is the answers and it's almost like along the journey and every step of the way there's always been that um, level of complexity that we find and then just bursting through that level of complexity is you know the answers to what we need can you explain so i want to actually know what you did in uluru for a month secondly can you explain why uluru because a lot of viewers aren't from australia and what it is and what attracted you to uluru and i just yeah what did you do for a month there yeah, well, we had a we had a um, dear brother of ours. Um, he basically said, oh, "I'm driving from um, Crescent Head, which is basically just outside of Sydney, all the way out to Uluru um, with his family, all the way up to Darwin." And I basically just said, "I'll go." That was just after I'd um, given up work, and it was one of those occasions where it just presented. So I said, "Well, I've got to get into flow." So I said, "I'll come with you." So he had a coaster, a Toyota coaster bus. Um, and he was meeting his family in Darwin, but wanted to go on his little pilgrimage himself. 
And what happens on those trips is because there's so much space out there in the outback, it's a lot of things started happening for me physically. I started breaking out in all these blisters and stuff like that. So yeah, what I learned out there is there is so much space and there's no interference. So a lot of information is accessible to you. That's probably just been percolating under the, the surface. So a lot of that stuff come to the surface for me and the questions, the deeper questions I could start to, to ask myself, what did I want to do? Where do I want to go? And I just, um, we got to Uluru one, one night at about seven o'clock and just put my hands on the rock and I just said, oh, I was just so exhausted from doing everything to the extreme, just so intensely. And for the first time in my life, I just gave up and just said, oh, just show me the way. And everything just unfolded good or bad after that by just sort of surrendering in that space. And what is Uluru for the people that don't I was just going to say, Greg, maybe search up on Google a few images of Uluru for our overseas listeners yeah. to just see what we're talking about because it's, it's a, a special very, place. Very spiritual sacred yeah, place. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And it's, and it's from, is it the, is it the heart? Solar plexus. The solar plexus of the planet. Mm. So, yeah, it's related to the solar plexus in in the human body. Um, and we spent some time with um, Cassidy Uluru, one of the last elders out there, um, uh, for for a couple of weeks when we were there too, and we stayed at his place. And it was interesting with staying at his place because we just had a tent. Once, um, once Sam, our brother, he took off with his family up to Darwin, and it was just Dave, myself and Marty, and we just had a tent just in the middle of between the industrial area of Uluru and where everyone was like um, the real expensive luxury places to stay. So we were just in the tent and one of the rangers come and said, oh, you guys can't stay there. Just stay at Cassie Uluru's place. And I'd gone from Hugo Boss suits, having a pretty plush life, having a unit overlook in Brisbane to like having a kangaroo tail out of this fridge in Cassie Uluru's place and just going, what, what, what am I doing? And just keep constantly surrendering. That was, that was the mantra. I just said, oh, i just got to keep surrendering to this. And out of his place, there's Uluru and um, Kura Judas, which is the other mountains in that area, which is a beautiful sacred space. And I was just staring out there just in a place of gratitude and he just slid up beside me. I didn't even hear him. And he started speaking in a way and he just said, that tree there, that mountain there, they're all, of my, they're all my people. And the biggest takeaway I had with that was almost like, oh, everything's starting to connect. Everything's connected. Because I wasn't deeply spiritual before those times. But I actually started asking questions or how are we all connected? So that started unfolding as well. So the biggest lesson for me out there was like natural to sort of sink into that natural world and that natural flow. It's like going for a walk in the morning along the beach and, you know, sinking with the sun, uh, following, you know, the equinox and the seasons. It's sort of like how we're designed to be living. It's sort of almost we've gone so far away from that. And that's what sort of mana is is for us, is like getting back into the to the season and back back to that natural natural way of living. Yeah, talking to you guys, you, you can sort of feel that that's a real vibe. It's not just marketing. It's actually real for you guys, which is beautiful. And I heard in the last pod a line which I took a note of, and you said the owners of Mana are the earth and her elements. We don't even have a business plan. And I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> like, and then you got us, uh, you know, coming up with a product within three weeks, wanting to go to market in two weeks, and they were in R&D for five years. Yeah, just like, cruising around. And I just... It, might, it boggles my mind, honestly. Because like, you can't imagine being alone for five minutes, can you? It honestly gives me anxiety. <laughs> but I'm actually quite relaxed at the same time listening to this. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's, it's a weird feeling for me, to be quite honest. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, there's some deep lessons along that way as well. And it wasn't just all like rainbows and you know, bright lights. There's a lot of experiences that, that build who you are. But coming back to that natural way of living in essence and, and having reverence and putting attention on that um, is really, really important. And that's what we talk about with our team as well, which is really important is, is MANA in essence is a project and it's almost a giving back project as, as much as well. Um, 
some of the decisions we make are not necessarily from a business point of view, but for, you know, giving back and making sure building communities is something that's important to us as well. You know, looking after our dear friends um, is really important to as well, bringing them into the project and really just making people like fall in love with what they're good at and and giving them opportunities to do that is really, really important as well. So I want to get into some of these other stories. Thank you for sharing this. It's 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 really cool to really deeply learn the backstory. I want to I want to dive into a little bit more of them that I that I know that you got. That's just touching the iceberg with this trip that you guys have been on. And I do want to get into the business stuff, but I, I want to just go a little deeper here for the and for for all you guys listening. I want you to really connect with, um, you know, just how deeply important the mission is here because the product and the strategies and stuff only really work when it's built on something great and that's something really deep. Um, tell us a little bit more about some of this stuff that you've done leading into now. And I, I know that I think it was I think it was um, you, David, that did Vipassana, was it? Or was it Brad that did the Vipassana? We've both done it. You've yeah. both done the Vipassana retreat. Yeah, I think it's a right to passage for our business. Everyone's got to do a Vipassana before they start. Yeah, you remind me a little bit like in a very, very different way, like the Fatita brothers who founded UFC. They have some very unusual um, business practices before they sold out to corporate, but they had like whenever they had a decision that they couldn't uh, figure out, you know, unlike the corporate books, that they actually got in the, roo- the ring and fought each other. <laughs> and so they have these completely non conventional ways of settling things and doing things. And I think you guys have got a very unique vibe there too. But so you did the Vipassana retreat. Um, for people who don't know what Vipassana is, can you just maybe share your experience of what Vipassana is and why you guys did it and what your experience was? Yeah, uh, Vipassana is like an 11 day silent retreat. So basically, you wake. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's freaking yeah, out his know, g-wagon he's like, over here he can't handle it yeah totally <laughs> yeah so it, it's an 11 day retreat so what you do in the morning is you wake up and from about 4 30 until about 9 30 at night you meditate over uh you know between one to two hour blocks and they teach you how to meditate and basically all it is is you've just got to focus on breathing in and out of your nose and just put the attention just on one spot you eat vegetarian meals only there's really no coffee or tea um, all you got to do is just get up in the morning and meditate there's a bell that rings and you got to make your way to the hall the women are separated from one um, part so the, the men and women are separated and you just go in there and you just have your allocated seat and you just meditate um, you an, don't talk for 11 days nothing yeah you I, don't I would pay to watch eric at that <laughs> retreat so, i would literally pay <laughs> Are you able to go and do, I, I heard somebody uh, telling me about this and they said, I don't know if it's the same retreat or not, but it was a silent retreat. And I said, but well, like, so you didn't talk. She goes, actually, what happened was when we'd go on walks, like I'd go on a walk by myself, she said, and I talked to the tree and I would talk to the sky and I would talk to the grass and this type of thing. And I was just like, it's pretty crazy. You know, yeah. like it's noble silence. So it, wow. Yeah, it's noble silence. You you could do that, but I, I think to get the most out of that whole experience is for me it was walking at lunch and walking at, you know, bre- after breakfast, walking around and just doing loops, but actually deeply understanding where the mind goes. Like to that point is like I really need to talk, so I'll st- start talking to a treat. It's like – but it was the first time it was through that period for me, it was the first time I actually did anything for myself that I truly – truly wanted to do for myself and it was the hardest hardest thing and the weirdest experience after like 10 days of not talking you actually get quite used to it and it's actually quite powerful yeah and what happened was after you could go out and they call these things called sankaras so it's basically your cells hang on to traumas and basically what they do without percolating through that time of you've got no distraction so you can't write read no, no phones, no outside influences or anything like that. So it's just you and your thoughts, which is quite powerful. And by the by, the last day, the Sankaras were bubbling up and I was quite nauseous because you're burping and all these things are starting to come out of your body, right, that you've held on to for such a long time. And then by the last day, I got out and everyone ran, like almost ran down to start talking to their experiences. And I just went straight into the bush. And I just sat there crying for like half an hour 
and like all was just purging all this stuff because it was like the first time I could actually say I'm proud of myself for doing something for myself and that was so empowering and that was part of part of my sort of um, message for myself was you've actually got to do things for yourself and for, instead of other people. Mm, what a beautiful gift to give yourself. Amazing. That's unreal. Um, let's talk, unless you've got any questions about that. Uh, I could be here for six hours, I think. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. yeah Just yeah. to finish on the past note, it's, it's, it is one of the greatest gifts you can give to yourself. It's such an interesting thing how we do have so much fear around it, but the whole program is literally set up so that we have to sit with ourselves. That's why you can't talk. That's why you're not supposed to look at anyone. That's why you're not supposed to exercise. That's why you're not supposed to read books is it's designed so that you sit in the same spot with yourself and see what's going to happen. Mm. And in this modern world, we just don't give ourselves that opportunity. There's so many distractions, but what you find sitting there is what you leave here with. It's the only thing you can take with you. So you might as well become friends with it now. Mm. Mm. That's powerful. Yeah, I've done, I've done a retreat um, called Vision Quest with a dear friend of mine, Rick Cowley, and I've done it twice. And people are like, what is it? What does he say? And I'm like, it's not what Rick says. He holds the space. And people have heard that in spiritual circles, but they don't understand what hold the space means or create a space. And he just enables a space where you sit and he asks you one question on a piece of paper in the morning and it's silent until after breakfast. And it's just the question's very, very specific. And you just sit there and, and any sane person starts to hear answers. I think you're actually a psycho if you don't. <laughs> and it's you just finally having the space to check in with you. That's it. And it's just life-changing. I've done it twice. It's so good. My son's in Japan right now. He gets back tomorrow and he's going down there for the first time in May. So I totally get that. Um, I want to hear a couple of other stories in the backstory of this product because they're really interesting to hear. Um, and, I, and we'll finish off with some of the crazy stuff like hanging with Rick Rubin in his uh, bungalow in LA and all this crazy stuff, which would be awesome. But you were like, cruising around in Egypt and under the Sphinx and all that sort of stuff. Can you tell us a bit about that and how it fits in with the journey as well? Yeah, sure. Um, it was a spontaneous trip going to Egypt. And, um, you know, I guess when you go through those places and you're sun gazing and going into the pyramids and, and meeting some of the guardians of the area, you're picking up codes, you're picking up education, information. It's not until really afterwards in reflection that you kind of realise that, you know, potentially that's part of some divine guidance or potentially it's just part of what you chose to do. But something then sort of starts to come through you pretty clearly that, you know, you just almost don't have a choice. You're just kind of following a thread. Uh, and a good example of that was when I ended up traveling back to Israel and, and didn't have a plan, uh, but went down to the Dead Sea. I hadn't been there before. Then we went over to Montserrat in Spain up to Carcassonne in France, and then flew back to Israel. Uh, the time when he had like a couple hundred dollars and landed in Jerusalem and it was freezing cold. It was, it was start of January, so it was the middle of winter. And uh, we ended up walking down to the Dead Sea. Didn't know how long we were gonna stay there or how long we were gonna last. At the time, we only went back down there because we knew it would be warmer because it was so much lower. And uh, we ended up staying there, f sleeping at the bank of the Dead Sea for 88 nights. So and when you say sleeping at the bank, like where, how, like, is this, a tent a is this literally just outside in a sleeping bag in a tent? We're or? just floating in the sea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so when we first got down there, uh, um, we'd bartered to get some tents, these really old tents. And um, we had a tent each, just like a single man tent. And we're in an area where there are all these sinkholes. So the community that was living there had to leave because it was so dangerous. But what it meant was there was heaps of trees that were no longer getting water because it's in the desert. But when the community was there, they were watering them because they had left all of that automatic watering had gone. And so we had fire. So we were able to have fires at night. So we were able to stay warm. And then it was about a week in, we actually found a, a little timber hut that was right on the bank of the Dead Sea that was used as a lifeguard hut. Because even though there's no um, sharks in the, in the Dead Sea or you, know, you can't sink because you float, 
because the concentration of the water is so intense, people get it in their eye and panic and get into trouble. So they had life lifeguards there when it was um, when there wasn't sinkholes and you could swim. Wow. So the lifeguard hut had been abandoned for a couple of years and um, we just inhabited that. So, so you're there for three months on the banks of the Dead Sea. Yeah. And was this, did this like form part of the product formulation or is this just one of those experiences that form part of who you are today? Both. Both. Yeah. So uh, sitting in that hut in the morning, um, you know, we'd watch the sunrise over Jordan and so we were sun gazing first thing in the morning. Over there, they get like 360 sunny days a year. So it's really good for that. We were reading some sacred texts like the Emerald Tablets, um, Secrets of Light by Walter Russell. Um, and we'd start the day kind of like by having a little fire and making a cuppa, sun gazing, reading this sacred text, then getting in the Dead Sea. So we're getting access to all of those minerals. And then there was a black mud pool on the right side of where we were sleeping. So often we'd get that on us as well. There was hot springs to the left. How many of you were there? Just two. Just to tell you. Yeah. Just, just two you, dudes. You two? No, it wasn't no. me. No, so that I was actually that Marty, the other gentleman. You and Marty, just there. hanging out three months doing that. Yeah. It's just like freaking. <laughs> like, Sounds fake. It, it's insane, right? <laughs> it's just so insane. Like I, I just, it's so unique meeting people who've just taken a completely alternate path. Let, let's fast forward a little bit now because like trying to re reconcile, like you're, no offense, but that's full on out there, bro. <laughs> like, like, yeah. I spent four hours at Talabodja Creek on the weekend. That's, you felt you like know. a hippie, right? Like you felt like you should, you, this you is took incredible. your shoes off and yeah. everything, man. Yeah. <laughs> like this is incredible. Like what? You know, you're putting that together and you're like, you, you've got that in you, that deep, deep, are out there spirituality but you've got this business which is crushing too and that's so fascinating to me and because I, I i remember when i was really young um in my early 20s i'm just i've just been trying to remember the name of the book um celestine prophecy, prophecy. Mm. yeah and i and i read the celestine prophecy and it had this really deep impact on me and mm. i got full on into meditating and everything and then I just stopped because I was like, if I keep dying down this path, I'm just going to disappear for 10 years. And I couldn't put my Tony Robbins tapes together with the Celestine prophecy. I was like, I had to make this choice because I didn't have the tools or the wisdom to, to realize you could probably do both. Yeah. And I just went the full Tony Robbins, you know, motivation, success path. Interesting, it, that book. That, yeah. that book it was the book that started it all for me too. Right. Yeah, so so I was reading that and I'm listening to you and I'm like, it sounds like you guys were like actually doing your own Celestine prophecy type experience, but in real life, not just a story. Um, and I would recommend people who are curious about this kind of living. The Celestine prophecy, prophecy is fictional, I believe, but it really does get you, well, fictional in, in, in so far as it's a story. But many of the things in there are actually not fictional, which is what makes it so fascinating. Have you have you read it out of interest? I, I haven't read it. No. Yeah, you might like it, dude. Yeah. Janet definitely like it. Yeah, yeah. My yeah. my wife's right into spirituality, but so were you raised in a spiritual family, or did something happen in your life that took you down this path, or were you like as a as a kid, were you always kind of into spirituality? Well, like, where did it come from? That's what intrigues me because my wife, you know, there was a bit of trauma that happened for her spirituality, right? Her parents got divorced and that was like from there, she just opened up and work, went within. And um, yeah, and just, just very interested because like, you, yeah, you I think a lot of people a, are like a lot of people yeah. are like that. They're, I picked it up early, but I'm really curious as well. Like, where yeah, like, where does it where does it come from? Like, I can see yours, right? You explained yours, and I can see that that happening. Mm -hmm. But where did yours? It's come a great from? question, and I just remember from as early as I can having the same questions that uh, was the catalyst for me to stop working. And um, I went out into the center of Australia as well um, before Brad, just on my own and camped all around Uluru for a month um, by myself. Uh, but it was just those questions like, to me, spirituality is even a funny word. It's just what we are. Yeah. You can't not be spiritual. You can't avoid the fact that we are part of something bigger. <laughs> and uh, for me, the fact that so many people don't give themselves the time and space to say, who am I? 
blows my mind. I, I just can't understand it. For me, it got to a point where I, I couldn't go another day going to work in the corporate world without giving myself some time and space to investigate that question. So that, that was really what did it for me. And that, you know, when I write down my list of goals or when I write down the things I'm most proud for, proud of, uh, that's always at the top. The fact that I gave myself as much time as I needed and wanted to explore that question. And that's the thing I love about the traveling that Brad and I did and the traveling that Brad, Marty and I did. We went to these locations for an undisclosed length of time. So when we went to the Dead Sea, the reason we can stay, stay there 88 nights is we, weren't, we didn't have another flight booked a week later. So if we felt not to stay there after two days, we would have moved on. But because we just felt like we were going to be answering that question for ourselves, And the thing I love about that is now amongst the two of us and the three of us, we just have this unwavering understanding that we can get through anything. We have like this trust and faith that everything's going to be okay because the truth is that it will be okay. Yeah. Is Marty part of Mana? Mana? Yes. He is. So you guys are all in it together. All right. So let's let's move it forward a little bit to the business side because I think we could sit here talking about this for, <laughs> for all day. But what I'm so impressed is like with you guys is I – I meet a lot of people who are sort of self-described as spiritual, but there's a real authenticity to your vibe. Like it's, I wish people could actually, I don't know where you're listening to this right now, whether you're on a bus or in a plane or, you know, going to a job that you hate or whatever, but sitting here in the studio with you guys is, is kind of cool. It's, it's very special and, and real. And um, there's so many crossovers with, you know, your, your journey and, and what I've, I think fantasized about doing, but haven't really pulled the trigger on. And I, I just love that you guys have done that. So let, let's bring it back to the business for a minute. We might dip back in. I'm sure they're probably inseparable anyway. How did Mana start? So you've got this product, you found these ingredients. Um, how did you go from going, hey, we've got this black goop that we found in the Himalayas while we're camping on one of our spiritual quests? What was the very first step of going, could we commercialize this and turn this into a business? And did you have any stuff come up for you around we're going to start a business and make money from this and how did you deal with it? Yeah, I'll, I'll answer the first half of the question and then I'll let Brad answer how we got into sales because he kicked that off. Yeah. Uh, so from my intention, it was really, again, going. I understood what we had in these two very special um, compounds compounds nutrients mm. uh so from there it was really around i guess checking in with ourselves: is this what we want to do mm -hmm. like we want to share this with the world that became super clear then it was finding the absolute best sources of those uh and then making sure there was a sustainability to it like we were going to be able to provide um, and supply large volumes so let's pause on that for a sec before we go into the next bit. Where was the most sustainable, high-quality source of it mm. and how did you start negotiating to secure that resource? Mm. So that's where like a lot of our – because everything we do is relationship, network-based. So that's where a lot of our travelling really um, came into its own. We had – developed like lifelong friends along that journey. The Dead Sea is a great example. Uh, we were close to a place called En Gedi and Kumaran. Kumaran's where the Dead Sea Scrolls were written. Uh, en Gedi is where there's a kibbutz, which is the Israeli name for community. And so we befriended um, the people that were running that community, uh, Avi and Saar, uh, and their mother was actually running the, running the kibbutz. So, we got access to laboratories there that they were just building into the base of the mountain at Masada. Uh, we got access to the, uh, all the minerals. The minerals there are different to anywhere else on the planet. Um, and so we had that relationship. That's an example of one where we could get water from there ongoing. Um, we also get water from down off Tasmania, which we solar evaporate for three years. Um, and that's a process we just had to work through how much of that we can get access to, but obviously the ocean and the Dead Sea are two very abundant places. Yep. Uh, the Shilajit's a bit trickier. That's what I was gonna ask you, where are you get, where did you, where, where is this stuff in the world and how do you get 
Like, yeah, so it's in the mountain tops. You can get it anywhere from kind of 5,000 feet above sea level right up to 20,000 feet above sea level. The higher you go, the better it is. So do you buy it from like these these communities up there or yeah, how so, does that? It sounds like it's almost like going into the Colombian jungle. Yeah. <laughs> Different substance, yeah, no. but similar, <laughs> like we're sitting with the American gangsters here. It is pretty wild right. um, as far as the locations are extreme. The first shilajit I got exposed to was at Mount Kailish in Tibet, which is the most sacred mountain in the planet. Um, all of the Hindus and Buddhists look up to that mountain as like the home of Shiva, mm -hmm. which is God. Uh, and Shilajit's known as the blood of Shiva. Shilajit actually means blood of the mountain or destroyer of weakness. So we accessed a supply out of uh, Tibet. Um, we had some challenges with that. There wasn't a huge supply, plus the, the Chinese didn't want to export it when certain things happened on the planet. So they wanted to keep it for their military and their own people because of the antiviral properties and uh, rejuvenating properties that it has. Uh, so we also have access to it in the Himalayas. So we employed over 600 people last July and August to go and collect it for us. And now we've got access to it in Siberia as well. So everywhere we get it is above 16,000 feet because it gives us really high concentration of nutrients. So there are local dealers of this stuff once you know who they are. There is, yeah. I had a goal in, so I had three Shilajit suppliers in 2019. When I knew the scale that we wanted to take the business, I set myself a goal to find the top 20 on the planet uh, and traveled around doing that. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. So you just like get this stuff exported out and it go, where's your manufacturing? Is it in the US or in Australia? Uh, so it's in the US now. Yeah. yeah, we've manufactured in Italy, we've manufactured in Vancouver, and now we're manufacturing um, in the center of the US. Right, and it's a US company. Most of your business is in the US right now. 96% of our sales are US based. Right. Uh, we do sell globally. Uh, so we sell to Australia, UK, Middle East, Asia. Everywhere, yeah. Everywhere. But so you, so you guys are living in Byron area. Um, how many staff do you have in Australia? How many do you have in the US or elsewhere? Yeah, so now I'm actually on the Sunshine Coast. Oh. Brad's in Brisbane. Oh. We spend a lot of time in Byron, but that's where we are okay. at the moment. Brisbane, Sunny Coast, okay. Yeah. Uh, we've got a team of about 30. Yep. Um, locally, we've got a team of five or six. And then the extended team are really contractors, yep. whether it's retention people or designers or um, suppliers, manufacturers, all of those things. Okay. Yep. So let's, let's talk about the business. So all your transactions are done on the website. Yes. Yep. How, how do you drive traffic to this business? Like what, what caused this thing to take off a year ago? Like how did you start? You've got your product, it's being manufactured, you've got beautiful packaging here, um, you've absolutely nailed the delivery mechanism, the branding's, you know, second to none, but it's now day one. Hmm. And you go, now we've been to the top of the Himalayas, we've met all the right people, we shook all the right hands, we've paid all the right things. How do you sell it? I'll let Brad answer that now because he was, uh, he was the good, catalyst. It's selling. a good question. I guess we had a few people come in and, and do various sort of launch strategies for their product. Our major goal was to have enough stock to have like six to 12 months worth of sales. Um, so that was a really important part because of having a subscription model. So making sure that we've got enough stock for, you know, two to three months so that LTV can sort of sort of even out over three months. Um, I guess from everything that I learned when I was on my own journey as well, sort of come into it, it's almost like 20 or 30 years of sales and marketing in a traditional sense, parked in with sort of four or five years of watching as many YouTube clips as possible on sales and paid acquisition and Facebook ads and all that. I guess knowing the special properties of this product, I guess the model for us was partnership based and getting a paid acquisition team was really, really important. We went through a couple of paid acquisition teams that just didn't get the product. Um, I guess we we're in Sydney, at, at, we we're at Sydney and we had all the stock and we we're basically running out of money, we had no money left. So that was a night I was eating in a hotel room with just a packet of chips, sort of working out how the hell are we gonna actually get this product sold. Um, just, just for perspective, how much did you put into the business at this point? 
be a million dollars. Yeah. Oh, really? Of your own money to get your stock in there? Uh, we had some investment capital as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So you had an investor or investors? Investors, yeah. And you'd, you'd raised about a million bucks just through your personal network? Yep. Okay. So you've raised about a million bucks and you're down to being in Sydney with a bag of chips. Yeah. Is that right? But yeah. you've got a bunch of stock. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we're, we've got all of our stock sitting in a 3PL just going, you know, we're dribbling orders of 5,000 for our networks and stuff like that. Um, so what I did is basically made a top 100 list through Instagram of all the podcasts I wanted to get us on and all the people that I'd been following in the, the wellness spaces in America and how big that market was. So I just made a top 100 list and I started reaching out. Instagram accounts. Yes. So, yeah, it was um, Russell Brunson does, he, he talks about the top 100 list. Dream 100, I think he calls yeah, it. Yeah, that's it. That's yeah. correct. Yeah. So I made the Dream 100 list and I'd been following some of these guys for two or three years on their journeys and stuff like that on podcasts. And then um, one of our internal team, one of our contractors knew, um, I don't know if you know of a guy called Zach Bush. Um, but you had a company called Ion and they did supplement companies as well. And she started working with us on contract um, from a marketing. And she said, oh, get in touch with this lady called Erin, who's in sales, who basically goes around and pitches people and brands to podcasts. So that's what we did. So the next morning I got an email saying, catch up with this Erin, rung her and basically spoke to her from Sydney to the US, got her a heap of samples, sent the next day. And then she took these samples to a podcast, uh, a guy called Josh Trent, who's now a partner of ours on the Wellness Force Radio. So I was just sort of following the steps one by one. And um, so we sort of booked, we were in the US, we had to borrow another 20,000 to get our flights and get to Austin, Texas, because I highlighted Austin, Texas is where the huge wellness communities are, like your Chris Williams, all your big podcasts like Joe Rogan and all that. So I wanted to go to the epicenter of that to give us the best opportunity to sort of leverage off what we had. Um, and Aaron put us in contact with Josh. He rung me the next day or sent me a message on Instagram the next day and just said, oh, this is going to, this, this product's going to blow up. She it's huge in our communities. Um, how you guys are delivering the mechanism. He goes, I've got to introduce you to a guy called Austin from Austin. And I went, okay. He goes, oh, he makes like, he works with Aubrey Marcus and all these guys from a paid acquisition point of view. And then we just got in contact with Austin the next day. And he actually gives his daughter Shilajit, who's two years old. And he knows Shilajit really, really well. And he just took, he, he got the product and said, well, this is the formula. He said, send me a heap of samples. So I sent him 20, 30 samples and he just shipped it out to everyone. And then everyone, then I started researching what um, affiliate marketing was because I never knew what it was. So I then worked out what the affiliate program we had to do. So it was just like one step after the other. All right. I, I want to dive into the affiliate marketing side in a minute, but I just want to unpack that quickly because there was a lot there um, and really, really prescriptive, helpful stuff for entrepreneurs. So essentially you started with a Dream 100 list. Yep. You re started reaching out Instagram DMs or G or emails that were provided or both? Whatever I had accessible. Okay, so you just reach out and it was, was it a, what kind of email was it or, or DM was like, hey, this is us, this is our product, you know? Yeah. Just obviously. very simple. Yeah. And we'd love to be on your pod to talk about it. I'd love to see your samples. Is it kind of that? Yeah, totally. Just get samples. Biggest thing I had was just to be sh like really short and sharp and yep. basically offer as much value as possible. Yeah. You know, like the biggest thing that Dave's talked about today is like relationship and networks, mm. just making sure once we get in front of people, like sitting in front of podcasts and spending time with people is our most important. Like that's the most sacred thing we can actually do, mm. sit with people and actually spend time with each other. Mm. Um, and we just had that uh, that philosophy when it comes to the paid acquisition. And a lot. So this is not paid though, right? This is this is organic reaching out to influencers yeah, really correct. at this stage, podcasters being influencers. Correct. And we'll talk about paid in a sec because that's obviously a whole different world which we want to get, get into. But so you're just outreaching. One thing sort of led to another and you meet this girl, Erin, who – once one person read your email and said, talk to Aaron. Aaron does product placement into podcasts. Did you have to pay Aaron a commission? How does that work? Yeah, totally. Yeah. So you just pay her a commission of sales? Um, or how does it work? We Because we call her the OG, she's the first person. Because we the, the biggest thing is we didn't know, I didn't know what I was doing. So I was just basically going one step after the other. 
But do you put her on a retainer or does she get a coupon code or how does she get paid? No, we just pay her like a spot fee. A spot fee for a podcast placement? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then basically that podcast costs us, we're sitting in a, uh, in a cafe in Austin and we didn't, <laughs> we had to pay seven seven thousand dollars to get onto this podcast. Okay, um, and we didn't know at the time. So basically, we just had to come up with another seven thousand dollars to get on that podcast. And is this like, does the fee vary based on the size of the pod, like the number of subscribers yeah. or something? Yeah, is totally. That, this is really granular because this is the stuff you can't get anywhere, which yeah. is why I'm really grateful for you answering it. With the, you said initially twenty thousand, uh, you borrowed so. That initial twenty thousand, and then another seven thousand. When you say you borrowed, did you have to give up equity for that, or was that just a, literally a loan to somebody or a mate? No, that was just a loan. Yeah, just a loan. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. you had to re, you, you repaid back. No equity. It was just debt. Yeah, and that yeah. was that was really relationship and network based as yeah. well. Um, and when people see that the the amount of efforts, like as soon as we wake up in the morning to when we go to bed at night, this is all we do. And that, yeah, I can see you guys not having too much trouble raising yeah, money like just I, because you can just see that. It's yeah, real. like a, if I was the guy at the time that said, hey, come to a meeting, I want to introduce you to someone. And you guys told me the story and where this stuff is coming from. And it's coming from 16,000 feet up in the Himalayan. Like I, did, I would invest just because of the commitment. The origin story like, is fabulous. Yeah, that's unbelievable. Yeah, and that's that's one thing for brands to really, you know, to, to really take knowledge of, take note of is the fact that like you've got to have a really cool story and an authentic story as well that's actually original to you. I think a lot of brands sort of regurgitate a lot of the old stuff out there or copy each other and doing that. Like make sure whatever it is for you as a brand, it's authentic for you because and be proud of that story as well. That's one thing. Yeah, I speak to this a lot and most people go, my origin story is just so boring. Like I've got a client at the moment that we're coaching and she's, um, wanting to make a transition from corporate to being, and I've said, you should be a property coach. She's done like multiple small scale residential developments. She grew up with a Greek father who taught her how to develop property and she's made, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars each time consecutively. She just doesn't miss. She goes, I haven't got a story. I'm like, you have the most amazing story. You know, you're a mum. you've got a couple of kids, you're making hundreds of thousands of dollars at a time. You know, you, your story is I'm a normal Melbourneian housewife that's not a supermodel, not an influencer, not overly confident, but I make money back to back every time. It's a great origin story, like how an average Aussie mum with self-confidence issues makes millions of dollars in real estate. That's your brand right there. And she just doesn't, doesn't put it down on paper, but it's true. So let, let's, let's just... Uh, keep pulling on this thread. So you, you meet this Aaron, you pay her the seven grand spotters fee, which is totally fair. You go on this pod. You, it's just like this. I imagine you're telling the story of the product and how, and then people are vibing with you. What happened then? Yeah, I feel like we what we did is um, Josh did an incredible job of the interview, and we got some sound bites out of that uh, interview that were really unique. Um, and we just sent them to the paid advertising team and they just whipped those up and then basically the rest is history. Okay, so it wasn't the podcast so much that generated the sales, it was the amplification of the clips on paid. Is that right? Or did you generate sales from the pod itself as well? Yeah, I mean, I would say it was predominantly uh, the paid ads team mm -hmm. um, exploding those out across the internet and getting um, I mean, they were a very experienced, very successful successful paid ads team. They worked for some big companies. Yeah. Uh, they only took us on because they believed in us and the product so much. Yes. Uh, and they were surprised with the conversion rates. So it's an agency that grabbed your content and then chopped it into real shorts, just repurposed it across the net, uh, across Meta, I guess, is it? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yep. And the important thing is there that it was, it was one podcast after the other. So it was like a road show and they've got a, like what I can see works really, really well for brands and specifically ones like us with a really cool story is you just get on as many podcasts as you can and do a road show and actually just go deep granularly into your story. Yes. And, and there's some beautiful pieces there that when you're in that flow state again, when everyone's sort of just vibing, a lot of beautiful things come up. So that's the sort of, I can see the formula when we're talking about formulas for brands. It's like what you're just saying there is get your unique story, own it and bring it to life. Yeah, so important. Like I think everybody listening to this, 
me included, wants to rip this open right now. Because I've connected with the story, you've now brought so much meaning to this box. It's not just a box. It's this incredible story of two guys who just like took a different path in life and, and camped at Uluru and, and like the lengths you went to to find this stuff and yeah. source this stuff. Like, and now I've got it in this box in my hand. That's the power of an authentic story because you've now connected us. And not only just to buy it once, probably now to like people are going to like you as a result of hearing this and want to keep buying from you. It's so powerful. Mm. Yeah, the designer that's designed those boxes, you, you even look at the wave, the golden wave on that, it's like a sin wave. Mm. It's it's like an, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it's a sin wave. So, you know, there's a lot of detail and a lot of intention because that's what a lot of the big brands do, right? Yeah, all your Louis Vuittons and all the, the top brands. They like, invest in brand. Yeah, they study, study them. We study all of those, like your Amigas, your Rolexes. There's so much beautiful detail in what they do. Mm. You look at a Rolex box, you know, that there's so much beautiful detail in a Rolex box or an Amiga box. Um, and just study them, Porsches and all of those, not just for the actual consumption, but the inspiration is the thing that I find with them. That's we we talk about that daily. The art of it, right? Totally. Like a lot of people miss and just don't have an appreciation for the art of it. There is yes. actually an art to be honored in this stuff. Like you picked it up straight away. What what great, um, Eric was pointing at is the box has this sort of gold sound wave on it. But when you go to the website, it just so happens that we've got the screen up on the, the part of the website on the homepage. It has that aerial view of what looks like a coastline of where is that? It looks like Israel or somewhere. That's the Dead Sea. That's the Dead, the Dead sea. sea. So the aerial shot of the Dead Sea is, you know, strikingly like what's on the box. And I'm sure it's probably not by accident. It's that level of care and that level of detail to the details that really does matter. So you've got, so when you said you went on a podcast tour, was this just from your Dream 100 list or did you have a podcast booking agency? No, that was just from the Dream 100. And then, then everything started to flow, you know, they're all podcasters that you're hitting up? Yeah. So you're just hitting up the podcast contact information going, hey, this is us. We're these crazy dudes from Australia that have, did, you know, was there a page you sent them to that told sort of a, just do DMs? Yeah, just DMs. Just but, brief DMs. Yeah, just brief DMs on Instagram. And it's just showing a lot of people love as well too, like, love, like authentically loving people's content and what they're actually sharing. Yeah. Because the thing that we love doing now is with affiliates and partnerships is, supporting them with their message and i think that's really really important it's like what you're saying with that lady like lifting people up is it's interesting the stage that we're going through from a leadership point of view now is like lifting people up and empowering them to do what they love yeah. and i feel like that's what you know potentially what we're here to do is to actually do that for ourselves and each other it's really powerful because when you put your when you when the lights go off on the final day you'll remember some of those things not from the things that you're consuming and doing. It's actually what you're actually giving back. What's underpinning all of this again, guys, I just reiterate, there's a product under here that's phenomenal and obviously is deep, deeply connected to you. And so it makes it so sustainable and easeful. If it was a product, you're just trying to shill something. It's not sustainable from a heart energy, you know, in the end, you just run out of fuel for it, right? But when you're actually authentically connecting with people and authentically like, I, I really like your content, here's why, here's two or three things I've seen that I enjoyed, thank you so much for that. That shows respect for the process. Mm. And so you've basically just gone through Dream 100, gone to the States, said we're gonna be here for this time, we'd love to be on your show, be honored to be on the show, whatever. And you just go around and do that tour and you're grabbing the best bits and then you're putting it in the hands of the paid traffic guys and they're running ads on, is it mostly meta network, like socials, like Google at all? Or is it is anybody searching for Syllogit or this type of supplement? Is it mainly, so I mean, I, I guess I'll look it up on Facebook ads library, but but it's it's ads on socials. Is that basically it? Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're starting a bit of Google now, mm. um, but that wasn't the plan to start with. I think it's like the, the formula of going one product, one channel is really powerful because you can put all your attention on that. Um, through what I've learned, through what they've done from a paid acquisition point of view, just like one product, one channel is really powerful. Because if you diversify too much with other different platforms, like your TikToks and stuff like that too early, uh, uh, you don't have enough um, push through in, in those specific accounts. Can you step us through? Oh, sorry. You're right, yeah. How many podcasts, right? 
how long did it take and how much did it cost at that time? Out of the, out of the dream 100, did you do 100? Did you do 50? Did it take you a month? Did it take you six months? And how much did they cost? Because you said that one cost about seven grand for one. Yeah, yeah. That was the only one that we've paid for so far, isn't it? Yeah, we've, well, I was thinking about that as well. We've paid for a couple of others. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, however, yeah, that was the first one. And then uh, a couple of others on that particular, well, while we're in Austin, just happened organically. Like we're at a dinner yeah. party. Podcast. We told our story and someone said they uh, knew Luke's story. Um, who has a podcast over there. So we we're on that podcast like within a few days. Yeah. And he's usually booked out for months. But he said, I just... I read, read your story and just had to have you guys on. So um, that's an example of just like a, um, uh, like a one that happened because it was. Show, you showed up. <laughs> yeah, because we showed up. Yeah. And so we've kind of just been doing uh, like one a month basically. And, and we only bring in like one partner a month and that's enough. Yeah. yeah. And, and did you hire, like to get the clips did you hire your own videographers there to get the clips or did they actually give you the clips, the podcasting company? Yeah, so the podcasting company will often make up a bunch of clips for themselves that they share shorts on there. Yep. Yeah, shorts. And then they'll also give us the raw files that we'll send off to our content creating team and they'll do the same thing. Um, so I'll, I'll let you guys know the formula that we use for our partners. Yeah. Because it's super simple and it when works. When you say partners, who, what are you talking about? Like a podcaster or who's a partner? So a partner or a famous person, an influencer. I can't influence. Okay, yep. Great. Or a podcaster. So yep. anybody that has uh, followers on socials, mm -hmm. followers on Meta. Mm -hmm. So let's say you've got someone that has a million followers on Meta. Mm -hmm. We'll say to them, let's create some content. We can do that on a podcast the easiest way or they can just go away and with a box of mine and create some content for us. So we then say, we'll give you a percentage of commission. So you create the content. So it's usually going to take half a day. We'll go away, um, get that content, slice and dice it into shorts. Then uh, we'll make paid ad, we'll pay for paid ads from that content. We'll give you guys a commission of sale. And the only other thing you have to do is give us access to whitelisting which is basically your audience. So we can, we're confident enough now from doing it with several partners that we can build them up to $5,000 commission in the first six months for the lifetime of the sale, which no other brand does. You're doing like, yeah, so you're paying them in perpetuity for as long as that customer's with you. Correct. On subscription, that'll be what, great. What, what sort of commission, are, what percentage are you giving them? Yeah, it varies. Um, initially, we were quite aggressive, uh, you know, because we were excited, we want to get, wanted to get sales. Um, we realised that's not so sustainable, especially on lifetime commissions. Mm. Uh, but that 10% works for us. Okay, so yeah. let's, let's just break that down again. So you contact the influencer, you go, let's make some content together. First step that once you've got their face on the product with you or they've given you the content of them promoting it, you're going to run traffic. So you're going to pay for the ads with their face on it, right, and just pay them a commission on all sales. And I suppose there's a coupon code or something with, that tracks that. So put in coupon code unemployable or whatever, and that's how it's tracked. Is that right? Exactly. And then so they just make the content and lend their face. Are they promoting it as well on obviously their socials? They don't have to. They don't have to. Don't okay, have to. interesting. They don't have to. So do they often do it anyway? Yes. Yeah. Be we create such an such an attractive offer for them mm. because literally all they've got to do is say half a day's content. We can run with that for six to 12 months. If after six months we build them up to 500,000 a month commission. 500,000 a month? Sorry, 5,000. Sorry. 5,000. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So five hundred grand. Sorry, five grand a month commission coming in for them. Yep. And and some we've got to ten. Mm. We can get them to ten after twelve months. So let's say a partner that we've had for twelve months is on ten grand a commission from content that took them three hours. Yep. It's a no brainer. Yep. Yes, yeah, so especially when you. So I guess from your side, you're only gonna you're gonna test that content and that influencer and if they work and convert you keep throwing money at that campaign if they don't then you don't 
and it's a win-win. Yeah. They haven't lost anything. They've spent three or four hours on it. And they're incentivized to create as good a content as they can because you're spending the money behind it. So how much money would you be putting behind them initially in ads for an influencer? And then I guess you just scale it once it back. back yeah, it's works. just the same with, with everyone because you're just validating that, that content. Right. So we spend about 30% of our revenue on paid ads. Mm -hmm. So 300 grand a month, for example, on a million dollars. Correct. US dollars. Yeah. So you're constantly, you bring on a new partner, you test how good their content is and how how real their following is, I suppose, and how, they, how good they, they are converting. And um, and then, uh, yeah, I get it. So, so you just reach out and say, hey, would you like to make content for half a day? We'll pay for the ads. You can promote it to your following as well if you want to, but you don't have to. It's, that's almost impossible to say no to. So we've got a one pager that says what I just said to you. Yeah. And on the back, there's two case studies of real examples of how it's worked. And I would love to see some of that content that, you're, that they're producing for you. Yeah. Um, it'd be great to see some examples because I think, yeah, I, are you surprised by, if you leave it to them, sometimes it, it'd be kind of interesting what they bring back creatively that you might not have thought of before, or is it, do you find that it's better to do the pod? What works better? The pod's just an easy way to do it. Yeah. And it means we get to meet them in person and hang out, so we love that. Mm. And usually because the model's so successful, like if they get to 5,000 a month commission after three or four months, they have never experienced that before for you. lifetime commissions. Yeah. So then they start pumping the product and creating yeah. more content. How many influencers would you have working with you now? A dozen. A dozen, that's it? That's it, one a month. So, so you've got a dozen influencers and then is that, are you doing paid outside of that or is it just the content from the influencers that you're doing paid or are you doing your own paid as well? A uh, little bit of paid as well That's now, but just only in the last few months. It's all just been through the pay partnerships. I think we've got to remember, they've only been going for 12 months. <laughs> like, yeah, it yeah. feels like this business has been, you know, with all this R&D and yeah. stuff, it feels like obviously it's been around for a lot longer than yeah. you just have been live for the 12 months. Like I think of, young Chris Griffin who interviewed you guys, he'd be all over this model, right? Like, yeah, that, like those types of micro, I mean, he's, well, he's a our latest, follower. He's our latest partner. Yeah, he's there you go, right? Like that, yeah. that's a perfect target yeah, market perfect for you guys. Target. And, yeah. we, and the reason we only want one a month is it's so sustainable for us. Yeah. We get to spend time with them. Brad's spent like three or four days already with Chris. I've spent one. So we love to meet with people in person. We mm -hmm. love to... Everything's relationship based. As I said, we don't have contracts. It's just that simple one pager. If they say, if we say yes and they say yes, then we're off to the races. Um, so, what is, do you have like a cutoff with influencer size? Do you need like half a million up, or because you're buying paid ads? I suppose like Chris is such a fucking charming little bugger, isn't he? Like he's handsome and he's nice, and he'd be a great fit for this. I can see why you're going for him because he's just authentic. Is it more that or are you looking for people that are like Chris and have the following as well? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, usually what we're finding is like people like Chris are perfect. Um, it's more the relationship side and personable and he gets it. Mm. When people get what you're doing in the product and the story, they can then portray that through authentically. I think there's a lot of products. Right. Yeah, it's more the authenticity around the whole project. And it's almost like we always have this thing we know a lot of other brands in our space that they've got a whole um, whole marketing division that looks after paid affiliates or the mm -hmm. affiliate programs. Dave and I do all the meetings. We want to make sure that whoever's representing the brand is aligned. And in the first five minutes, we'll we'll do it straight away. We just had one last week, which is uh, he's, who's coming on, who's a legend of a guy, um, linebacker, ex NFL player, absolute legend super spiritual and we spent five minutes he gets it he talks the same language and we just said yeah no worries here's your code this is what we're going to do yeah no worries i'll, I'll talk to austin austin send, sends him a link it's just simple austin sends him the link to his facebook account stuff boom done mm. and he's a big name he's helped a lot of people get mm. stuff out mm. so just that one relationship will bring us in well, a million dollars this year yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there's so much to be said for authenticity. I was only going through this with the boys a few days ago. We opened up our emails that we send out to our database to promote the pod. And I sent one on Easter Saturday and it wasn't to promote a pod. It just said, I'm struggling. And mm -hmm. it was a no photos. It was just a short, very personal email from me to the audience saying, I'm struggling. 
because I have been like finding as I get older, um, you know, trying to reconcile, I've got everything, you know, all the stuff, the nice house and money and all those things. But I feel like my happiness is declining and, right. and that my mental health has been declining. And so I just said, you know, and I'd watched a video that day, which I found helpful. And so I said, you guys, I thought I'd share that with you so that we can make it okay to talk about this stuff. And I found this resource that I think was helpful for me. And if you're struggling, maybe it'll help you. Have a great Easter. And Beautiful. I had six times the engagement on that post, that, that uh, email than any email we'd ever sent. And then uh, I sent another email on Tuesday to promote last week's pod. And it was about a woman who suffered severely from imposter syndrome. And I got rid of all the photos and all the stuff that would normally be in the thing. And I said, this is Helen. And she didn't think she deserved it. And that was sort of the headline. And it was like double or triple the open rate of all the other pods. And, and authenticity in a world of noise and speed and all this stuff. And I think that's so smart. Like, you know, Chris said to us about you guys, because Chris interviewed you. I understand there's another layer of that interview now, which, I, which is awesome. Um, and he said, these guys at first, they come off as like really, really spiritual, which they are, but God damn, they're, they're operators. Like they really know how to run a good business. And that's, I think, very true, right? Like, but not in the old fashioned way of like, oh, you know, all these hacks and manipulative. It's like, who knew that actually just being real and really getting your influences to choosing people who really get it and really want to talk about it because people's radar for bullshit is so finely attuned that when you watch a video and you know that person's actually into it, it's a whole different world. And, and I, that's why I, I think you guys have scaled so well is because the influences are obviously there with mm. you, which is really cool. Like just, he, just hearing the story, right, and the authenticity around the story, like it just makes you want to help, to mm. be honest. Like I'm in this space, like in this chair going like, like I'm in, you know, like yeah. I, I mean, I don't have a massive following of, um, on, on socials, but like, you just like, I'm like committed. I'm like, wow, like this story is just unbelievable. Like I'm looking at James and he's just like. <laughs> James, James is on right? the side here, guys. And I, I know he's thirsty to come on and ask questions. So if you've got any questions, James, jot them down and just pass them to us. Yeah. But I have, um, touching on that point, how do you manage the spiritual side and then the commercial side, commercial gun business, like, because they're. We get that a lot, actually. I get a lot of spiritual people that seem to, that, that do contact me and they they can't reconcile the two together. Like this, but you guys have done a beautiful job of this. You're like totally chill with a million dollars a month in sales and growing to two. You don't seem to have any blocks there. Is that what you're getting at? Yeah, yeah. Like how, how do you manage it? Because I'm sure like w when you look at someone that, like I can feel the energy, right? I'm like, these guys are like cool dudes. But then you got to put your business hat on and at times you got to be a little bit ruthless and a little bit shrewd you know and, and i mean that's in, in my business journey anyways maybe you guys don't do that because of the that spiritual side and there's maybe more of a deeper understanding and knowing like um what, what you were saying before so yeah i'm just very interested to see how you yeah the it's yin a great question it's I, I i think for us the two have become the same it's not like a spiritual hat and a and a project hat. Uh, yeah, so I I think they're both the same, and um, I mean we just don't have those difficult decisions to make from a like the I guess the team that we have. We're super cautious of who we bring in, and we need to feel that they're coming from the same space of us, which is a place of service. So, so we're never looking to take something from the project. We're only looking to give to it. And that's the critical component. Brad and I can feel straight away if someone comes in and wants to take from it. And we'll just say like, that's, that's not what this is. We're not taking from it. We're just building on it and growing from it. Now, the lessons that you can learn from within inside mana and the networks that you get access to and the education that you get from being exposed to the project for say 12 months, you could then go away and do your own thing. You know, you could then go away and put a product through this same um, 
operational or structural model that blueprint. we're telling you yeah. through the same blueprint and, and, you know, earn 100 grand, 200 grand a month profit. No problem. If you've got the level of authenticity and quality of product under it, right? Yeah. Yeah, you'd have you to probably have. could even without it, but not sustainably. Perhaps. Yeah, you'd have to have the, the quality definitely. Like that's mm. just something we just don't compromise on. Mm. But once you've got a quality product that's unique in the market, you can absolutely put it through the same um, same system. And, and, you know, we're running it, as I'm saying, as, as a service, as a not-for-profit and as a community. So we just don't have like things are either attracted to us or they're not. And we just go with what's attracted to us. And all of those suppliers, all of the people, they've, they've, they're part of the family. <laughs> so, so it is a not-for-profit business. Yeah. Right. Is it going to stay that? Is that the Well, business? I should clarify that. So it is set up as an LLC in the States. Mm -hmm. And then our Australian component here is a foundation. It's a not-for-profit. Mm. However, like even within that LLC model, every all the profit we're just going to be reinvesting back into inventory and some of our inventory for upcoming products is very expensive like pure gold mm. uh and then we've got a whole community division and we've got a whole manufacturing division so i can't see within the next three or four years that we would be making any profit going outside of that it's all just going to be reinvested into growth because a new product is literally pure gold in it right yes yeah um, it's interesting. A lot of listeners here actually have not-for-profit businesses, but not by choice. <laughs> They're just not profitable. It's so hard. I got a, a few other questions. Right. So, are you guys just taking a modest wage out of the business to, exactly, to yeah. live? Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Enough to get you by for eighty-eight days by the Dead Sea and get you home again. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I love it. And sovereignty is a, a big part of it as well. So it's almost like. There's other projects to put attention on, like your cryptos and a lot of that with self-sustainability, like sustainability of your, of your own sort of outside of mana is really important as well too. Yeah. So it's no one's actually, to what Dave was saying, not everyone's pulling on it. You know, everyone's sort of it's reverse model is putting as much value in it as you can and learning those skill sets and taking those skill sets and offering them for other people. Mm. So I get a massive kick about building people up and making sure that they are so into what they're doing. And then that sort of gives me a kick of, out of it as well. Yeah. You said something there, not everybody's pulling on it. And that's a big thing. You know, Eric says this over and over and over. So many people start businesses and it's all about how quickly can I get 10 grand and 20 grand a month out of it where you guys are like, how do we build this? How do we make it bigger? How do we help more people? How do we serve the owners of the business of Mother Earth and her elements? I mean, man, that is like a completely yeah. different way but it's another way. It's a spiritual way of, of saying what Eric's been saying. Like, uh, you know, we tease Eric sometimes about his fancy G wagon and stuff, but it took him 12, 13 years of living with nothing because the boys there never started MX for money really. And they still don't. They, they've created an incredible culture, 170 staff in Burley. It's just a pumping business doing 10 million bucks a month but or, or thereabouts. But it, that, it only got there because these guys lived, you know, like for the business and fed the business and too many people try to take too much out too early. I just want to ask you about your agency um, over there. So you've got, you've obviously got some guys. I mean, it's, it's nice to have the spiritual side, not nice. It's essential in your case. Um, but you've obviously got some pretty sharp dudes when it comes to analytics and, and um, you know, running your traffic. Um, what kind of retainer do they charge and, and just, to help people get around this because oftentimes people don't have measures. Oh, I'm going to get a guy from Pakistan for 50 bucks a month and it's just not going to work, right? Like, do, do you know what the retainer is that you pay your agency and has it scaled with spend? Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. It's eight grand a month. Yep. US and or Aussie? US. US, yep. And then uh, five grand commission on ad spend. So what, what does that mean? Sorry, 5%. Five, sorry, five, sorry. Five percent of ad spend. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so in the scheme of things, for those listening, that's that's up there. But mm. but but that's when you when you're playing big boys numbers, you got to play with the big boys and the big girls who who do it. So eight grand retainer, five percent a month spend, and is it locked in or is it basically month to month? Basically, they're saying, look, if we don't make, produce the result, you guys can leave. It's locked in. It's locked. Uh, sorry, no, it's well, it's 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 not really. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, we don't have contract with them. Yeah, um, they're the type of people who say, look. 
sign us up three months. If it's not working, just leave. Is that is what I'm saying? Then? No, we didn't even have those conversations. To Dave's point, it's almost like we just knew. Yeah. Like there was a deep knowing with that relationship. It's it, because then you're not like trying to grab from that relationship as well. Mm. We have this process of just let them do what they need to do and support them instead mm. of not asking them, well, you know, for this and that. We just go, well, what else do you need from us? What else do you need? And that creates such a deep level of trust. Um, but are yeah. they niched in, in consumable type supplements or are they quite broad as an agency? They're quite broad. Okay, they do a whole yeah, bunch of things. They, yeah. they sell pots and pans. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but they get it. And that's that's the big thing we love. And they've become like, you know, as Dave's saying, family. They're right. based in the US, right? It's a US agency. Yeah, correct. It's incredible. So so an example of the first couple of hours when we met them, we met them uh, in Austin, sat with them for two hours, and they knew as much about our product as we do. Wow. That blew our mind. And then they say they only work with partners because they've got a lot of people wanting to work with them because they're so good. They've got a reputation over mm. there. And they said, we only work with partners where we would use their product and we're super passionate about it. So when Brad says, look, we just knew, we did just know. Yeah. And then, you know, when they say, oh, we can grow this 30% month for month. And six months later, they've done that. And nine months later, they've done that. Like, Were they the guys that put you onto the strategy of content creation through influencers that believe in the product? Was, were they, or did you bring that or did they? Yeah. They did, yeah. They said, all right, this is the way to do it. Go do that. And yeah, and they just doubled down on that too. They just said, oh, we think this is going to work from a, a process. And it's almost like that's how we started. So they just kept doubling down, just do more podcasts, do, get more content like that. So we've just done and that. So you just, yeah, so you yeah. Do, they just say, here's the format for the con the, the bit, the, the, the type of content we want. It's kind of UGC, isn't it? It's, it's user-generated content, but with you involved in it sort of sometimes and other times they just go away and do their thing. Exactly, and then they just yeah. punch that out. It's so much smarter because, you know, I've never heard of this actually. Like I've heard of user-generated content, but you just go to a platform, you pick the people that you want to go and do and they go and do their thing. But the idea of actually saying, hey, listen, the, the idea of saying you don't have to promote this to your following if you don't want to and you'll still make money, that's a game-changing approach to it of saying- There's no will, expectation. Yeah, I will pay it for ads yeah. to drive attention to you, <laughs> right? Because you are, that you're running paid traffic to their face. Yes. Yeah. And I, why would you not say no? To, why would you not say yes to that? It's, so, it's such a clever distinction. In the last couple of years, I've been so involved in this the, the content space and seeing it evolve. And what I see brands and like creators doing is a co-creation happening, whereas brands won't out to um, creators and treat them like shit. It'll be like a symbiotic relationship now where you'll actually have just a family of creators that believe what you're doing and you all move mm. together. And I feel like that's the powerful economy and that new markets that we're going towards right. because guys like Chris, I just want to hang out with Chris, right? Yes. And and you guys know him personally as well. He's he's cool, he's 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 young and it's like he gives you vibrance and energy. Yeah. And that's like with other people in our partnership model, they just got incredible stories. A guy called Darren Olian, he's absolutely brilliant. He come down here with Zach Efron to what was it called? Um down under yeah a series An amazing down series to Ma yeah down unbelievable to yeah and he's he's a dear brother and i just like to say like whatever you guys what what you guys are doing like what can we do in the us with that like and yeah, we, we got so we got a project with what well, diane talked to you about off the pod <laughs> but um that we think is a perfect fit not just for that model but for that whole yeah approach um I, i've got to ask about rick rubin um like because rick's been like in the last few years, people have just in Australia started to hear who Rick is. But I lived in the States for five years in LA and oh, I've, wow. fo I've followed Rick for 15, 20 years. I've been a fan of Rick Rubin. Yeah. Um, tell me about how that came about. For those who don't know who Rick Rubin is, I mean, you can you can look him up. Um, he looks like ZZ Top, except <laughs> he's nothing like that. Anyway, he's, he's, he's a very unique individual, just you guys are kind of remind me of him a lot, but his his philosophy, his art, his approach to managing artists is just second to none. So how did that happen? Like, and and you went to his compound in Malibu or wherever it is. Yeah, so Rick's like the godfather of music production. Mm -hmm. Like, so many people have gone to him 
and walked away creating their greatest ever album. And I mean, give just, it to give it some context. We're talking about Adele, Red Hot Chili Peppers, all of them, all of them, and totally diverse. Jay Z, mm. you know, Jay Z tells that great story mm. of when he went to record Nine Nine Problems. It, at, I think it was at his studio and then upstairs Rick would pop upstairs and he had like an 18 piece classical orchestra and then he'd nip back downstairs and mix 99 problems with Jay-Z and just like it was no big deal it was all the same thing kind of like what you said there's no separation here it's just all one and Rick's kind of that as well it's just all love and artist and expression and when you look at some of those bands that he's been working with since the 80s and you run the math he was only in his 20s yeah so he was this elder guru guy that could tap into seeing the music in a very innovative and unique way back when he was in his 20s. And the artist. And the artist. Like, to, to, yeah. to, like he didn't see colour, he didn't see background, race, nationality, he just saw the heart of the artist Yeah, and people felt it. But anyway, I, I'm going to keep going again, so I'm going to shut up and listen because I want to hear the story. Yeah, so it was, it was just again um, – really through following the breadcrumbs. And what I mean by that is we ended up on the Luke Story podcast when we were in Austin. Luke was going over to spend some time with Rick and Elle McPherson and uh, her partner who's a drummer in a band, I uh, can't remember which band, and he took Mona with him because um, he was just loving and raving about the product after the podcast and we had some before and after the podcast. And uh, Rick tried it. Um, had some really good feedback and then we didn't hear any more for about a month and then somewhere else again he tried it and then he actually reached out to us. Through your Insta or something? Or? Uh, through email, through, through a member of his team. Right. Um, and got us to send a bunch of boxes to, um, to him and uh, Huberman um, and they were raving about the product. So then... He basically said, like, next time you're in town, come to the Shangri-La, which is his uh, recording studio, and, and hang out. Oh, my God. How jealous I am. Like, I've read so much about the Shangri-La <laughs> and, and how he's oh, – there's so much I could say just about the, the space. But anyway, what was that like? Yeah, so we went there. He actually made a song for us, a mana song that's on the product. Uh, it's actually it's, – it's, it's a little jingle that's – so it's on a podcast that he did with uh, Tom Hanks uh, last September. I think it's about 20 or 30 minutes in. So that was cool. He actually made, made a mana song. Um, it's like a jingle. It's like an old kind of vintage style jingle. Uh, we were hanging out in like Bob Dylan's bus and all the different rooms and playing the instruments. Did you have a sauna with him? You know, he's got the famous sauna there on there. No, we uh, didn't. Uh, we, di we didn't. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess that's just one of the beautiful parts of the journey, right, is we get to um, have experiences like that and – uh, the product with the gold that's in it um, has a lot of things that Rick is very interested in, as a lot of our affiliates are. So that's kind of um, – we'll be launching that with uh, pretty closely with some, some people like Rick and others. So this, this all came from this Dream 100 start out, right, with your list and then people who know people. And when you really hit the bullseye of what your product's about, that's the cut through that you can't – you can't fake that, you know, and, mm. and so you really start there and then somebody listens and somebody listens and before you know it, you're starting to get messages from Rick Rubin and the, the doors that I'd open from that would be, in, I mean, just the very top. Yeah, it kind of flips to a thing where you're kind of trying to figure out how to sell to where it actually becomes inductive and, you know, we got to a point from our supply side because it is very labour intensive uh, that, you know, we were just keeping up. <laughs> And we, yeah. and we changed manufacturers. Yeah. Uh, and then when we launched the, the Mana Gold in June, we have a pretty strong feeling of what that's going to be like in the market and what will come back at us again. Because uh, it's literally the highest frequency supplement on the planet that assists with genetic liberation, which is something that... It's a whole nother pod. It's a whole nother, <laughs> it's a whole nother, it's a whole nother conversation. Yeah. yeah. So you've got just the two products now, the third one literally is gold no the third one comes it's called ocean it ocean. comes out on the 22nd of april which is world earth day mm -hmm. and then the gold comes out on the 21st of june which is the summer solstice in america so it's the day of the most light mm -hmm. and gold is uh crystallized light in a metallic form mm. what's bitcoin 
<laughs> Bitcoin, Bit, Bitcoin's digital gold. <laughs> yeah, exactly. oh, that's a whole other discussion. Uh, like, you know the word flow, and you guys yeah. use it so much. Like, you guys are just so in flow. I can feel it, man. The energy, yeah. like, honestly, this has been my favorite podcast day. Eh? Like, I just, I'm so intrigued, man. Honestly. <laughs> Eric, Eric said to me before we started, he's like, you guys, I don't know how we're going to keep these guys on the business side because they're so like spiritually yeah. flowing. <laughs> yeah. And, like I'm looking at you now. It's like you've had a massage. My, honestly, I am. Yeah. So relaxed. Like just, yeah. I could sit and talk all day, but I mean, so we'll be going for like. Man. Yeah. This is what I mean. Yeah, like we could just keep going. But guys, um, what, how, how can people get their hands on the product? Just go to the website, go buy the product. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and is there any, anybody listening out there that, that should contact you guys that can add value to the project? Who would you like to hear from, ideally, that's listening? Or anyone that's inspired. Anyone that's inspired. Okay. Yeah, yeah. because I wouldn't want to put a, um, a block on anyone that, you know, is not inspired. For anyone that's inspired, um, that's listening to the podcast um, and, you know, wants to, to share their journey and share their passions, mm. that's what's powerful for us. Yeah, like Brad said earlier, we don't have social media managers or anything like that. We do it all ourselves. We read all of our messages. We so, read all so of our emails. So how do they connect with you? Just through the website or socials? Or yeah, you, website. You've got Insta as well, right? Yeah, at Mana Vitality. Mana Vitality. Yeah. M-A-N-N-A? Yeah, correct. Vitality yeah. on Insta. And there's so much I want to talk about. I want to jump in and, and see how you guys are doing this more, but it's I've learned personally just – the business stuff's exciting to me, but um, particularly where I am in my life at the moment, really uh, have enjoyed meeting you guys. It's inspiring for different reasons to me. Um, so thank you. I appreciate it. Same. Honestly, like it's, I can't even explain it, to be honest. Yeah, it's, <laughs> I just see what, what you guys are doing. Then I look at my life and I'm just like, fuck, I got so much to work on. Yeah. yeah. That's real. Yeah, no, we really appreciate yeah. being here with you guys. It's always amazing to share. So thanks, Eric. Thanks, Adam. So cool. You, you guys really embody what we're trying to do here. And you know, we have the boxing kangaroo in the corner and we just, you know, we, we love this part of the world. You know, we love the Gold Coast. We love Southeast Queensland. And, and we really want to sort of play a small part in transforming the image of this great state mm. um, and, and sort of showcase people that are doing really epic things. Um, you know, yes, in business, but in other ways as well. And it's so good to see two Aussies that are living from their heart, taking on the world and just dominating from the gate in the US. Like mm -hmm. that's so inspiring to so many people. And I, I just hope that wherever you're hearing this message, you're just hearing this incredible story of uh, people who've put together um, that, that puzzle of, of, of uh, fulfillment personally and the way they roll and successful as well and they're not mutually exclusive it can be achieved in a package and uh and, and here's proof from our own backyard so i'd love to get perry to uh book in another podcast in a certain amount of time maybe a year from now or whatever yeah, it is totally. to do a follow-up for sure and just see where everything's at we could do one in the u.s yeah love that yeah that'd be cool next time you're over there um we, we, we want to get over there with what we're doing the, the product we're about to launch in a few months is we're really going to launch in the u.s to start with so awesome we'll awesome. talk about that and i think it'll be a good good match yeah but all right guys thank you for watching um we uh we appreciate your attention uh we will see you on the next podcast if this has touched you like it's touched us drop a comment like subscribe do all that stuff and most importantly tell your friends we do this to inspire people and to share with people so um, you know, help us spread the word and grow the channel. Thank you for watching, guys. We'll see you soon. Bye for now. Hey there. I hope you enjoyed that episode of Unemployable. If you'd like to watch another episode, just click there.